Welcome to the first supplementary lecture to lecture 10 in biochemistry and this is a review of thermodynamics. You're looking at the classic hair metal band rat with two T's and they sang what my opinion was the definitive theme song of thermodynamics, Nobody Rides for Free. It was their last song before the entire species of hair metal was wiped out by grunge music, a great tragedy, but it was the uh, uh, played over the ending credits of Point Break, not the bad Point Break that came out a few years ago, the good Point Break that came out 20 years ago. So if you're looking for a classic, uh, check out Patrick Swayze and Keanu Reeves in Point Break. And be sure to compare it to uh, The Fast and the Furious as well, the first one as well, and, and discuss among your friends the similarities um, of, that, of those two movies. Thermodynamics is a very important topic, and it, and it is summed up with the idea of nothing happens for free. It's the accounting laws of the universe. It keeps track of everything, and it can be basically summed up in the first law and the second law of thermodynamics. And thermodynamics has a long history of people figuring out what happens with energy. It was becoming really important as steam power was taking off. What was the nature of work? How was heat converted to work? And these rules came out of that. And the idea was the first law of thermodynamics is basically energy can neither be created or destroyed is what it's summed up to. There's all kinds of ways to state the laws of thermodynamics depending on the math you're intending to use and the purposes. They usually use different words. Um, but first law is basically uh, all the energy has to total up. Was it used to do work or was it released as heat? Uh, it's all there. The second law is basically the law of entropy, which basically says in any closed system, entropy must always increase. Um, and this law is stated in such a way that it's basically saying everything needs to spread out. If you have a piece of metal and it's hot at one point, pretty soon that heat will spread evenly throughout the entire metal. And it will do that spontaneously. And it will never, just on its own, concentrate back to a single point. Entropy demands that things be spread out, that things be at their most uh, disordered. And uh, all of these guys in this uh, picture here had uh, uh, contributions to thermodynamics. They all fought over who said what law first, because as you can imagine, there's all kinds of ways to state these laws. And lots of people stated the first law, lots of people stated the second law. Everyone thought they were first uh, when they figured out they were talking about the same thing. Um, so uh, a history of lots of contentious letters written back and forth about who was first. Um, you may have heard of two other laws of thermodynamics. There's the third law. Uh, which is that a perfect crystal will have zero entropy at zero degrees Kelvin. And the zeroth law, which is a, uh, basically saying if two things are at equilibrium and something's at equilibrium with one of those, then all three things are in equilibrium. Those two laws are basically, um, I would say, there to uh, underpin the math of the first two laws. As they did the math of the first two laws, they realized there were some statements that had to be made um, uh, in order to, uh, you know, assumptions, not assumptions, but statements that had to be true for the first two laws to work, and those are them. So they're kind of bookkeeping. The real laws of thermodynamics are the first and second law. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, and everything's going to get worse. Those are the first, the important two laws of thermodynamics. And they reveal themselves in equilibrium. Everything in biochemistry is in equilibrium. Even reactions you think of as one way are an equilibrium. Um, it's just that if the equilibrium favors the product um, so much so that you can't even detect the starting material once we reach equilibrium, um, we would often perceive that as a one-way reaction. But everything is in equilibrium. Um, so equilibrium is important. Here I have two things in equilibrium, A and B. And if you allow it to reach equilibrium, you can determine the equilibrium constant. Under whatever the reaction conditions were for this reaction, no matter if you start with A or start with B, you should always end up with the ratio. And this is called the reaction quotient here. And when the reaction quotient reaches a steady value, you have reached equilibrium. The equilibrium constant is equal to the reaction quotient when we are at equilibrium. And remember, the reaction quotient is multiply the concentrations of all the products together and divide them by the concentrations of all the reactants multiplied together. You'll recall that from freshman chemistry. And you know Le Chatelier, you know him, right? Le Chatelier's principal and Berthelot, they made a lot of contributions uh, in the field of equilibrium and two guys you should get to know better. Now, let's consider a classic equilibrium. And this would be the equilibrium that's involved in muta rotations of sugars. Remember that that acetal there, right there, that carbon, it's got two bonds to oxygen. That was the former aldehyde. That alcohol that closed the ring to make this bond and there's the oxygen of the aldehyde, that can open up again. And when it closes, you could have the other option. Or we could go back to the first. 
But either way, there's an intermediate that's open. So there's two things that are in equilibrium. And in equilibrium with the beta, that means alpha and beta are in equilibrium. There's the zeroth law in action. So these two structures are in equilibrium through the open aldehyde structure. And eventually they'll settle down to the final value. If you just let them sit in water long enough, I think at, at uh, basically pH, pH 7, I think it, probably within 24 hours, you'll have reached equilibrium between alpha and beta. And, um, it's a slow reaction unless you add acid uh, or base to speed things up because it involves proton transfer. So if you add protons or add a base that can accept protons, it's going to speed up crucial steps. We can get the optical rotation of pure alpha pyranose, and we can get the optical rotation of pure beta glucopyranose. And notice those values are very different. When you look at the optical rotation of just glucose in solution, we get a specific value of 53 degrees per mole per 10 centimeters per liter. Um, that is the value we reach at equilibrium. But notice, it is not halfway between these two. So the equilibrium is not a 50-50 mixture. We can calculate what the concentrations are of the two species by that value, assuming there's only two species, and in this case there should be, and then we'll have the equilibrium constant. We know the equilibrium constant between alpha and beta. And you can see that once you do the calculation, it's almost twice as much beta as alpha. And you can see that, look, the beta is much more sterically less hindered. Look at that. Uh, that every single bulky group is in the equatorial position in beta glucose, in alpha glucose, almost that except the new stereo center, the option there is sterically hindered. So you got one strike against you here, it's a little less likely. So we're able to determine, you know, any amount of beta glucose you put in, you'll end up with 1.8 to 1 beta to alpha. Any amount of alpha you put in, eventually you'll end up with 1.8 to 1 beta to alpha. Now, if you know the equilibrium constant, you can turn that into an energy difference. Clearly, there must be some energy difference between starting material and product if the equilibrium constant um, has any value at all. Um, and you can calculate that. This is the famous equation for converting equilibrium constant into free energy difference. And there it is, just reordered so that you can get the equilibrium constant from the free energy difference. Now, this is the standard free energy difference. And standard free energy is the free energies that are measured at standard conditions. And standard conditions are when all concentrations are one molar, temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, and, uh, and a few other caveats, you know, atmospheric pressure are things that are probably true anyway. Um, so all concentrations are one molar is the big one, and 25 degrees Celsius. So if you're under standard conditions, um, you can get the equilibrium. Uh, you can get the free energy difference. If you allow the uh, equilibrium constant to be achieved and measure all the concentrations, then you'll know what the standard free energy difference would have been if all concentrations were one molar. See, when all concentrations are one molar, I bet the situation isn't gonna stay there. It's gonna move toward equilibrium. And the energy released as it moves toward equilibrium is that standard free energy difference. The standard free energy difference is the difference between everything being one molar and everything being at equilibrium. At equilibrium, obviously, the free energy difference between left and right-hand sides of the equation would be zero. We're at equilibrium. Everything's even, Steven, energy-wise. That's why it's not changing. If we have a value for standard free energy difference when everything is one molar, that means that, obviously, the concentrations would change as we move toward equilibrium. Uh, Delta G is called Gibbs free energy. Gibbs was a very important American scientist, and look, they obviously agree. He has a stamp. He had a military ship named after him, a naval research vessel, and he wrote the book on statistics. Statistical mechanics, which is the uh, uh, calculating energies in single molecules, um, and uh, basically a grandfather of modern chemical thermodynamics. Uh, interestingly enough, I think his grandfather was uh, a, uh, or great grandfather was one of the lawyers in the Amistad trial, the famous trial about slavery uh, in the uh, 1840s, I believe. So uh, he's, he's uh, well connected to American history. All right, so free energy, what is it? It's a mixture of real energy, that's heat you can measure, delta H, enthalpy, you recall that from freshman chemistry. That is something you can measure with a thermometer. If the process moved from starting material to products and gave off heat or absorbed heat and things cooled down, you could measure that. And then there's imaginary energy, which I like to, I like to call it that, but it's entropy. Entropy isn't heat, it's not degrees Celsius, it's disorder, and it's, sensitive to temperature. 
if you multiply the entropy by temperature, you get something that relates to the equilibrium, that sort of changes the equilibrium as if it was energy. So free energy is not heat energy. It's a combination of real heat energy and whether how likely the reaction is at that particular state, you know, those concentrations. If something is becoming more disordered, delta S is positive. And if delta S is positive, you can see negative temperature times positive. That would be a negative term. And that makes things more likely, taking the energy to the negative direction. So more disordered, more negative in energy. If your real energy is negative, so we definitely release heat as we go forward, and entropy is positive, so this term is always negative at all temperatures, because T is absolute temperature, it goes from zero and up. There's no negative T in absolute temperature. Absolute zero is zero, can't go past that. So if that's negative and entropy is positive at every single value you could possibly imagine, delta G is negative. And then, of course, there's different combinations. What if delta H is positive? So the system takes heat to happen. But delta S is also positive. There would be a temperature at which delta G would be negative. Um, so uh, thermodynamics, a big field. Uh, after uh, Gibbs had been done giving his contributions, other scientists stepped in and, uh, and also concurrently and wrote the book on thermodynamics, Gilbert Lewis wrote the book on thermodynamics. All of these other guys made major contributions to thermodynamics, Nobel Prizes all around, um, except for Lewis, who, uh, who never got a Nobel Prize, even though he definitely deserved one. Um, he uh, uh, just never got one. His students, some of his students did, but not him. Um, so if we know the free energy of a situation, we could uh, tease out of that with uh, doing it at different temperatures, the delta H and delta S. Now, if you do everything at standard conditions, where all concentrations are one molar, every single concentration is one molar, you'll have the standard values. The heat released is, uh, when everything's one molar, um, would be the standard enthalpy difference and the standard entropy difference. And these can be calculated from you know, the values for elements. You start with the values for elements. You measure how much heat was released when we formed the compound from those elements. And so that's the internal heat of formation of that compound. And then the difference between the heat of formation of one compound and the heat of formation of another compound would be uh, of the product in your system under standard conditions would be uh, delta H. And so we can add all those up from tables and we're never going to do that in our course. We're gonna focus on delta G. So if we know the standard delta G, we can calculate from that the actual delta G. So there's delta G, that's the standard concentration if everything's one molar. But you know what? In biochemistry, nothing's ever one molar. So we have to add this concentration term. This concentration term relates to really the chemical pressure or the reaction quotient. If there's way more product than reactant, the chemical pressure would be pushing us toward reactant, right? If there's way more reactant than product, chemical pressure, you would think, would push us toward product. Um, so the reaction quotient in this equation is going to correct for, for basically the difference in um, energy due to concentrations. This is energy due to concentrations. It is pressure. If you have a whole lot of air in a tank and not very much outside, what do you have? Pressure. You have this high concentration inside the tank, low concentration outside the tank. I bet you're increasing the likelihood, well, you, you created pressure, you open up the valve, out it comes, right? Uh, the free energy difference of air versus air is the same. Why is it moving from one place to another? Concentration difference. So this is actually a real thing. Um, so the free energy of a situation is the standard free energies that have been calculated from the free energies of formation of all your compounds from their constituent elements. So you know their free energies of formation. You, the difference between their free energies of formation of reactants and products is the delta G for your reaction, but all your concentrations are not at one molar. So you add the concentration term and you'll get the real delta G. What if these concentrations were at equilibrium? What if you did your measurement after you reached equilibrium? Delta G has to be zero at equilibrium. That is one of the things that is true at equilibrium. Delta G is zero because we're not changing anymore. The initial state has the same energy as the final state. We have reached rest. And if delta G is zero, we obviously have reached equilibrium. That means the reaction quotient, whatever it is, is the equilibrium constant. So there's two things that are true once nothing's changing anymore. This value is in fact the equilibrium constant, and this is zero. This is you know, innate to the materials. That's a constant of the free energy difference at one molar. That stays the same. 
the gas constant and the temperature haven't changed. This is now zero. That's the equilibrium constant. That's what's true. And you can just write the equation that way. Look, zero is now equal to the standard free energy difference plus this term, which is now the equilibrium constant. And if you just reorganize that, you get the equation for turning for uh, that equation I showed you, where we get delta G, the standard delta G difference from the equilibrium constant. And you just reorganize that, and you can get equilibrium constant from the standard difference in Gibbs free energy. So all of that just comes out of this equation. The free energy of a situation, are we at equilibrium? If this is a small value, we're close to equilibrium. Some small changes in these concentrations could actually make get, get us to equilibrium or get us out of equilibrium in the opposite way. So the reaction would want to actually go in the reverse direction to return to equilibrium. And so pay attention to that idea. A lot of the steps in glycolysis are really close to equilibrium because these concentrations are close to their equilibrium values. That means they're reversible, or I should say easily reversible, because it wouldn't take very much, um, say, adding reactant to the system to push things forward. It wouldn't take very much adding product to the system to push things backwards. So reversible steps in biochemistry are biochemistry steps where the free energy difference at the concentrations observed is small. It's never going to be zero due to rounding errors and stuff, it's, but it will be small. If it's a small value, it doesn't matter whether it's small plus or small negative, it's a step that could go in either direction. If it's a large value, we're definitely under those conditions that reaction will only proceed in one direction because you can't imagine changing concentrations that much in biochemistry. Now, you can get tables of standard free energy differences for standard reactions. So here is a table that gave me the standard free energy difference for ATP hydrolysis. And it said under the conditions you know, that were listed, it's, there's a number of um, the pH is seven, there's magnesium in the system, like those sort of set conditions. Uh, the free energy difference is about minus 31 kilojoules per mole. And you can also get the free energy difference for glucose phosphate hydrolysis, which is minus about 14 kilojoules per mole. Now I wrote it in the opposite way. So there's the reactants and there's the products, but I wrote it in the reverse. And then you had to flip the sign of the delta G here. And because I wrote it in reverse, I did that because I want to imagine I'm going to add these up to create a reaction where it's ATP plus glucose. Let's create that reaction here. ATP plus glucose. ATP plus glucose gives me ADP, there it is, plus phosphorylated glucose. And you notice how the other things all cancel out. Phosphate on both sides of the equation, water on both sides of the equation. So since I wrote this phosphate transfer potential in reverse, I was able now to just flat out add these two together. And you recall that from freshman chemistry, just adding half reactions together, getting the total energy. Look at the free energy difference for phosphorylating glucose with ATP. If all concentrations were one molar, or really another way to say it is all concentrations were equal, um, this would be still minus 16.7 kilojoules per mole. So under standard conditions, all concentrations, one molar, uh, that is definitely gonna proceed toward the product. And really, you, you really can't under physiological conditions, given the amount of ATP and ADP that are in a cell and how much glucose is available, you can never imagine situations where the, the measured delta G delta G without that little zero, would be much different than this number. So it's always going to be a reaction that's going to favor products. That's one of the classic one-way reactions in biochemistry. And if you look at the delta G values that are measured in a typical cell, when you, when you look at the concentrations that exist in a cell, let's take a look at what we see here. We see, so glucose phosphorylation, catalyzed by hexokinase. The standard free energy difference, minus 16.5 kilojoules per mole. The delta G observed in a cell, even worse, because of course the glucose 6 phosphate is always getting used up. It's going, it's draining down the bottom of the glycolysis pathway. It's always at way lower concentrations than you'd see at equilibrium. So we're always way out of equilibrium with this step. It's just a step, when you look at it, it is way out of equilibrium. So if you have um, all four of the uh, molecules involved, ATP, ADP, glucose and glucose 6-phosphate at cellular concentrations, and you look at it, you would go, that is way out of equilibrium, and it is going to go forward. So it is steps that are way out of equilibrium in cells are the driving steps. Steps that are almost at equilibrium, look at that. The measured delta G so is, is tiny, and as a result, that could go either way. Some small change in concentration, and that reaction could go forward or reverse. Right now, it's kind of drifting forward. 
But, you know, just because someone's kind of wanderingly aimless, aimlessly in a slight forward direction doesn't mean you couldn't give them a kick and make them to go backwards, right? Um, but you're not going to reverse a truck. That's like a truck. And that's just some guy doesn't know where he's going. So if you don't really care which way you go, you don't really care which way you go. You can go either way. Look at that step. That's way out of equilibrium. So, of course, if you look at the situation, you would say that's always going forward. And then all these steps. Look at all these. One, two, three, four, five, six. Look right down to here. All of these are nearly at equilibrium. Some are slightly negative. Some are slightly positive. But that's just, you know, the measured concentrations in the cell um, and, uh, you know, precision of measurement. They're all about zero for all intents and purposes. All of these are basically at equilibrium. This entire situation from, from the, the moment you make fructose, the moment you split fructose in half, all of the products of glyceraldehyde phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate, right all the way down to pyruvate, basically in equilibrium. If you've got phosphoenolpyruvate, you'll have equilibrium amounts of dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde phosphate in the cell. If, if this exists, all of these will exist in the cell because they're all at equilibrium. That means if this exists and I'm using up glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, everything would drain up, right? Because they're all at equilibrium. If you start to pull things away from the left-hand side of something that's basically at equilibrium, everything's going to move in that direction, Le Chatelier's principle. But turning phosphoenolpyruvate into pyruvate and making ATP is way out of equilibrium. Not as equi out of equilibrium as the standard delta G, but still way out of equilibrium. So that is a one-way process. So if your delta G is small, reversible. If your delta G is large, you know which way you're going because you are way out of equilibrium. Now, that just describes where you want to go. If you're way out of equilibrium, you want to make product. But how fast are you going to get there? That is kinetics. So in biochemistry, there's two ideas. Equilibrium, that is, where do we want to go? Do we not care? We're basically at equilibrium. If there's B around, there'll be lots of A. That means whether I need to use A or need to use B, there's lots of opportunities to do both. Or um, are we way out of equilibrium? If I look at a situation, I know that starting material is always going to be turned into product because there's not enough product, not nearly enough product to give us equilibrium. But how fast does that happen? Well, the rate can be measured. The rate is basically the rate of change of the concentration of the substrate or the rate of change of the concentration of the product. It doesn't matter. As long as you know the rate of change, I'm going to write it as V. How fast is that reaction happening? And the rate of reaction is equal to a rate constant times the concentration of the reactant. So if we're talking about the reaction going in this direction, it moves in this direction with this rate constant times the concentration of the reactant. And that gives, uh, and that is due to the difference in energy for crossing the energy barrier of the reaction. So if you think about it, the energy difference between reactants and products, that is going to govern the equilibrium constant. The energy difference between reactants and the mountain it has to climb, that is going to control the rate. The activation energy controls the rate. And this is the famous Arrhenius equation, uh, pre-exponential uh, constant times E to the power of the activation energy over the gas constant times absolute temperature. Um, that is um, sort of an empirical equation that explains the rate of your reaction. Now, Arrhenius was one of the great chemists, and of course, he won the a uh, Nobel Prize very on in the early existence of Nobel Prizes. You can imagine when Nobel Prizes were first uh, uh, created, there was probably 10 guys that everyone knew was going to get it in the first 10 shots, right? And he was one of them. He was one of the great chemists. And one of his major contributions, uh, in addition to um, uh, acid base theory, was the Arrhenius equation to explain reaction rates. Now, remember that the equilibrium is governed by the energy difference between reactants and products. That's going to determine whether we want to go from reactants to products. But the rate is governed by the difference between reactants and some transition state. Now, transition state theory uh, is a rich and well-understood system. And if you go into the details of transition state theory, you get away from just wishy-washy activation energy. What's that? Is it enthalpy? Is it free energy? You can actually use the free energy of the transition state, the free energy difference between the reactants and the transition state in a more rigorous way if you use the equations of transition state theory. 
This is not a reaction kinetics course. We are not going to be getting into these details, but the only thing I want you to get out of this is that the energy difference between starting materials and the highest point as we break bonds, make bonds, move things around, the transition state, which is a state where things are not at low energy. Things are breaking, things are forming, none of that's happy. We have yet to snap back into normal bond distances. So that sort of point where we're rearranging everything and then we snap back down to the product, um, that's the transition state. The energy difference between reactants and transition state is going to govern the rate of the reaction. A lot of people made a lot of important contributions on this. Uh, one person I do want to highlight is Michael Polanyi, his son, John Polanyi, one of our Canadian Nobel laureates. He won a Nobel Prize for really detailed uh, reaction kinetics in molecular beams in vacuum. Uh, you want some math, that guy can do some math. Um, so um, uh, Polanyi was a European scientist and his son uh, spent his career in Toronto and won his Nobel Prize there. Uh, Keith Laidler was a student of Eyring's here and he was one of uh, uh, Canada's great uh, physical organic, bioorganic chemists did a lot of work in enzyme mechanism and the kinetics uh, of enzymes and a great Canadian scientist and someone uh, whose name uh, I, I hope you'll remember. So if we've got a rate, we can express it with a rate law. Now remember rate laws from freshman chemistry? It's really just the reaction constant times the concentrations that are involved, the reactants. So if you have a first order reaction, you have a second order reaction, those are the rate laws um, of those reactions. If you have a reversible reaction, the rate law forward is the rate forward times the rate constant forward. The rate law back is the reactants for the reverse reaction, which would of course be the products, going back. And so forward, reverse, and if we're at equilibrium, those two rates must be so the same, right? Those two rates must be the same if we're at equilibrium because nothing's changing. We're at a dynamic equilibrium. Yes, we're going forward. Yes, we're going back, but overall we're not moving, right? And if you think about that, if, if that has to be true, you just make the rates the same. And what pops out of that, this term, there's the reaction quotient, products over reactants. There's the two rate constants. That proves that the equilibrium constant is just the ratio of the forward and the reverse rate constant for reversible reactions. There we go. The rate constant or the equilibrium constant is just the ratio. Now, what if I can speed up the rate of reaction? And to do that, I need to lower the energy barrier. Let's look at the um, reaction of uh, unit rotation of glucose. To open up that ring, I would have to recreate the carbonyl group and kick out an oxygen leaving group. And if I do that without help, I create this ridiculous split charged zwitterionic species. That would be extremely high energy. I know that's a strong acid, Right? So that's something that's not very likely at pH 7. I know that's a fairly strong base. That is not likely at pH 7. This is not something you're going to make at pH 7. Going through this route would be not just super slow. I'd have to say super like 15 times before I got to slow to describe how fast this reaction is. So basically, the, uh, with, in the absence of acid or base, this reaction really wouldn't happen. Um, now, fortunately, water is both an acid and a base. So what's the concentration of acid in water at pH 7? What's the concentration of base in water at pH 7? 10 to the minus 7, right? It's almost not there. So even though this reaction is going to need some help from acid and base, it would be super slow at pH 7. But there's the mechanism that would happen if, uh, if there was no help. Now, obviously, this reaction requires some acid help. Let's imagine it happening in acid. So that reaction is like it's just way too slow. The rate constant for this process is going to be a really, really tiny, 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 tiny number and, and not really important. Let's do it with some acid help. There's some acid. That proton could have come from water. Or what if we added acid and increased the concentration of hydronium ion? And then, then we have a ready source of acid to help protonate that carbonyl. And if we did protonate that carbonyl, some small amount of it looked like that, then ring opening of that species would be super fast. So there's an acid equilibrium equilibrium. So there's the acid form and the Ka for this acid is expressed this way, so that's why the Ka is under the arrows. It represents the equilibrium as if it's the dissociation of this acid. And we have a acid dissociation uh, equation for this. There's the products of acid dissociation for the protonated form, products over reactants. And then 
I can look at the reaction of this opening. Look, look what happens when I open. I go from protonated oxygen to protonated oxygen. That's no big difference. I'm now not creating um, a strong acid and a strong base simultaneously. I am going from a system that has strong acid in it to a system that is a strong acid to another system that's a strong acid, like no big diff. So this is going to be a lot faster. So the rate constant for this process, the rate constant for AH going to this product, not A going to the ring opened, but AH, the protonated form going to the ring opened, that number is way bigger than the previous rate constant. This is a much faster reaction, but of course it depends on how much of this exists. And if this is the rate determining step, the rate determining step is the last step in your reaction that's in the math. That's really what it is. It's the highest energy point in the entire reaction scheme. Everything after it is faster, so it won't show up in the math because um, anything that's after a slow step, uh, if it's faster than the slow step, only the slow step matters. But everything before the slow step matters. Look at a traffic, a traffic on a road, right? You got that one slow car. What's ahead of that slow car? Open road, because everyone who's faster than that car, they're gone, right? Everyone behind that car, they're all backed up. They can't go any faster than the slow car. But they're there, and the math would involve all of them. So this species is going to be involved because it's the reactant, which means this reaction is involved. Everything before this step is involved. So when you do the rate equation, there's the rate equation for this reaction. And of course, I need to know how much that there, uh, of that there is. Um, by the time you're done doing the derivation, you get a rate equation that involves how much A there is. And we know how much AH there is by this equation that involves the pH and the Ka. And there's the rate constant for the protonated form. So this term here gives you AH, and that's K times AH. So I now know that this reaction is, you know, it'd be faster if there was more acid. But this number here is much, much bigger than the previous number. It, we have reached a system where this is catalyzed now. I've, I've, I've found a lower route, lower energy route to product, and that's going to help the reaction be a lot faster. And so the scheme kind of uh, follows this sort of uh, idea. Um, when we're looking at a reaction, will it go? That's the equilibrium. Is it at equilibrium? I won't see a change. Is it way out of equilibrium? Now I know which way it's going to go. So look at the equilibrium. Will it go? That's the first question. And will it go is defined by delta G. If the reactants are higher in energy than the products, we are definitely going to see a trend. But you know what? It might not happen in our lifetime. So the next question is, how fast will it go? And that is going to be totally dependent on the energy difference to the transition state. And that's going to control the rate constant. Now, if we can change that energy, obviously the energy difference between protonated glucose and the ring open form was a lot smaller than neutral glucose and the split charged ring open form. So if we can change that energy, we can make the reaction happen a lot faster. And we can determine the energy of activation, and that's the energy of activation we want to change with our catalyst. Now, in biochemistry, only certain reactions go. If you had glucose and ATP in the same bottle, anything could happen. The most likely thing that would happen is that glucose would be oxidized by oxygen and turned to glucuronic acid or just wrecked. And ATP would be hydrolyzed by water to give you ADP and then eventually AMP and inorganic phosphate. So nothing that you want to happen would happen. Why couldn't that ATP just bump into glucose and transfer its sugar, or sorry, its phosphate to one of the hydroxyls? It could, but then if it did that, there's like six hydroxyl groups there. So which one is it gonna transfer it to? But you know, when you add the enzyme hexokinase, what's the only thing you see? Glucose six phosphate, because hexokinase catalyzes just that reaction. That's a possible reaction among the many but you would never, ever see that product in a mixture of ATP and glucose just sitting in a test tube because the fastest reactions are glucose just being oxidized by air and ATP just falling apart in water. And those just two wasteful reactions, those are by far the fastest. But guess what? They're both slow. So what if I turn the one reaction that I want from an unimaginably slow reaction to the fastest reaction in the whole test tube with hexokinase enzyme catalyst? Suddenly, Instead of seeing glucose slowly degraded over days and ATP slowly degraded over hours, I quickly see glucose 6-phosphate produced in minutes. And that's what biochemistry is all about. Your genes code for proteins that code for the only reactions you're going to observe happening. Anything can happen, but because of the protein catalysts, the catalyzed reactions are the ones we're going to see. Instead of a whole bunch of other reactions happening over days, the ones we want are happening in seconds. 
Look at that glucose 6-phosphate. What could happen to it? Lots of stuff. Most likely just falling apart in water, just the phosphate coming off in water. But in the presence of an enzyme, the fastest reaction is its isomerization to fructose. That would happen anyway. Add a little acid, it would happen. Um, but suddenly it's the only thing we're observing. And then that fructose can be phosphorylated by ATP. And again, anything could happen to those. Lots of things could happen. But in the presence of ATP and an enzyme catalyst, the only thing we observe is its phosphorylation at the number one position. There's lots of other hydroxyls could have been phosphated by that ATP, but the enzyme held things in such a way that only the number one was phosphorylated. So these specific protein catalysts, they're not just like proton, which just catalyzes the reaction in general. They, they catalyze only a very specific reaction. That hydroxyl group right there and that ATP are brought together. So suddenly only the things that are programmed for by the enzyme, I see the enzyme as a fourth level of the dogma in programming. Your, your genes, that's one level, make messenger RNA, that's the other level, which make proteins, that's the third level, which make chemistry, there's the fourth level. This chemistry is programmed for by the enzymes that were programmed for by your genes. Your genes don't control your proteins. Your genes control your chemistry. And only the fast reactions are seen. That's what all these biochemical pathways we're going to talk about in this course are about. We only see the fast reactions. It's the only thing we see because we only see what's catalyzed by enzymes. Why is the pathway going that way? Why are those reactions happening? Those are the reactions that are being catalyzed. But they also have to either be downhill in energy or at least at equilibrium with their products if you're going to see products, right? And every pathway is going to have at least one step that's way out of equilibrium and pulling everything in one direction. Because you think of a pathway as a way to, say, from glucose to pyruvate, right? If you have all the enzymes and all the cofactors and all the ingredients present um, for glycolysis and you add glucose, you quickly see pyruvate. So think about that. Uh, and, and think about thermodynamics and really just think about thermodynamics as these energy differences. What's the energy difference between starting material and product? What's the measured actual free energy difference given the concentrations that we observe? And what's, how's the energy barrier for the reaction affect the rate of the reaction? And how can I speed that reaction up by changing the energy barrier? And we'll talk about how catalysts can do that in class. Um, and so uh, enjoy... Um, these notes on the lecture and enjoy the notes on our aperitif of the day.